It is now my great pleasure to introduce and kick off this institute with our first session, our esteemed GC panel. And I'm introducing our moderator for the day, Jason Barnwell, one of our newest clock board of directors from Microsoft. Please welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary. So much of what she had to say really resonates with me. And uh, before I introduce our esteemed panel, I want to offer a little bit of context for, for why we're here today. Clock really is a community. And I have to admit, I have a, a deep sense of imposter syndrome right now because I've only been in this legal operation space for a little over two years. And I could not do my job if I didn't have the support of this amazing community. And I also want to reflect on the clock board. They are so supportive, and when I joined, they're like, hey, you know, we, we know that you're one of the people who've only been doing this for a more brief amount of time. W would you like to chat with some amazing GCs and, and learn, like, how you could serve your GC better? And I was like, yes, that would be fantastic. I, I didn't realize that I would be signing up for this and that you would all <laughs> be joining. But I really am in the same seat as you, if we really think about it, because I'm trying to serve our company better. I'm trying to serve my GC better, to bring more value. And so I understand the challenges you face, and so I hope to be your voice today. And what we're hoping to have truly is a conversation where I will stir the pot a little bit, but the people who see the bigger picture, the people who lead these amazing organizations can actually have a, have a conversation and we can sit in. And so with that, I'll start immediately to my left with Dorian Daly, Executive Vice President, General Counsel of Oracle Corporation. She joined Oracle as a commercial litigator from Landles, Ripley, and Diamond in San Francisco. She has a 27-year career at Oracle and became the General Counsel after leading Oracle's litigation group. She's been recognized for her work as a trailblazer, mentor, and advocate for women in tech law. And she's received the National Association for Women's Lawyers Challenge Award. She's also been named one of America's 50 Outstanding General Counsel by the National Law Journal, and her department has been the best legal department by Corporate Counsel Magazine. She was also recently named a Legend of the Law through the Burton Awards. I, 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 by the way, I'm going to have to truncate these because <laughs> we only have so much time. Let's, but let's move on. Okay, all right. <laughs> Board of really Governors really of Commonwealth so yeah. Club of California, Executive Committee, Business Software Alliance, and Board of Directors for uh, Chiefs for Intellectual Property, CHIPS, which is a great organization. Immediately to her left, we have Nigel Bond, uh, General Counsel, Wealth, Australian Banking and Technology of Westpac. He's a father of two, born in New Zealand, raised in Austria, not Australia. He <laughs> spent time in London and now lives and works in Sydney, which I believe is in Australia. <laughs> He's the General Counsel for the Consumer Facing Divisions of Westpac, Australia's first and oldest bank. And his practice covers several notable, notable divisions and brands, including Westpac, St. George, Bank of Melbourne, Bank of South Australia, and ROMS. And his team is responsible for the retail and commercial divisions of these businesses and counsels on the procurement of the goods, services, and technologies that support these businesses. He's also responsible for the BT brand that includes Westpac's wealth management business. And he is a clock veteran and proud supporter of a legal operations team. <laughs> and to his left, we have Julie Gruber. Executive Vice President, Global General Counsel, Corporate Secretary, and Chief Compliance Officer at Gap Inc. She leads a global network of internal and external legal and compliance professionals who support the company's business strategy. Her portfolio also includes government affairs, corporate facilities, and corporate administrations teams. And her leadership extends beyond the conventional GC responsibilities. She chairs the Global Integrity Committee, the Corporate Crisis Management Team. She's a member of the Diversity and Inclusion Council. She's a member of the Business Continuity Planning Community, Committee. She founded the Data Security and Privacy Council. She formed the company's risk committee and built the department's mentoring program. In addition to all of that, <laughs> she serves on the board of directors for Life, Life Moves, an organization that seeks to break the cycle of homelessness, and is on the executive committee for the American Heart Association's Bay Area Go Red for Women campaign. Wow. So uh, <laughs> please welcome her. That's just for you. And so one of the things that I took away when I was reading your biographies is 
you really are business leaders. I mean, so much of what you're doing just screams, it goes beyond the conventional uh, of, of just thinking, of, I'd say, about a pure counseling role. And so with that framing, I, I, I would really love to hear, Doran, how did you start the legal operations team at your organization? You know, what, did, what was it that you needed that took you down that path? Well, I started it um, through an acquisition, to, to be honest. I'd seen before uh, this particular acquisition, sort of Sun Microsystems in 2010, closed in 2010, that we needed to, to pull in some better um, ownership of certain business processes and better consistency across the different organizations, both functionally and regionally, because we're, we're everywhere around the world, as, uh, as, as many of us in my role are. And, um, and I needed it to be more and more efficient, not just currently efficient, but you know, in, in the future, continue to think about how we can be more and more efficient. So I'd seen this in my role in, in litigation, as different groups were handling things in different kinds of ways. Sometimes we were overlapping, things were repetitive, sometimes things were falling through the cracks. So when I became the general counsel 12 years ago, I started thinking about this, how to, how to, how to do it. And um, in 2010, when we acquired Sun, Sun had a very large legal operations team. It was one of the early companies with the, with the legal operations team, and it had gotten quite sizable. And I, I couldn't absorb that size. I mean, I think there were maybe 30 people in it, and uh, that wasn't going to happen. And, uh, but, I, but I brought in the, the leader of that team to help me think about how we could best build it out at Oracle, within Oracle, what our priorities were, um, and start that, start that process. So I've sort of inherited the function in a way through, through Sun, uh, and had a very, very good guide. Somebody had been doing this for quite some time, but then needed to make it very, very particular to Oracle. So there were certain things that we, we really needed to do in terms of that um, taking ownership, having somebody with ownership of the business processes, having better efficiency, and, and having consistency. And you know, the primary things that I was thinking about at the time was uh, a few things, but budgeting. I hate budgeting. I hate budgeting. <laughs> And, uh, and I'm, saying, I'm sitting next to a banker, so. <laughs> uh, but, but getting through the budgeting cycle in a, in a rational kind of way, because it seemed like every year there was, there was something new, uh, and I, I wanted to, to rationalize that, and then just internal cost control, that was a big piece for me. Um, billing and matter management, we'd had a couple of forays into it that had not been very, very successful when it hadn't been owned by somebody who actually knew what they were doing. Uh, I really wanted to have um, a program for our e-discovery platform. Being a former litigator, current litigator, never really gave it up. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we owned all of that in-house rather than having the different law firms we were working with tell us who we were going to work with. That wasn't working very well, it was very, very frustrating. So I wanted to own that. I could also bring my cost down. I wanted to have a more consistent and more rational and frankly a more functional and uh, satisfactory all around uh, internship and externship program and we really leveled that up and then was really focused on communications and internal training uh, and that was really the development of our knowledge management system so those were those were the starters We've sort of taken it from there but those were the big things that we saw could really help us get to those those high level goals of ownership efficiency and uh, consistency Wow, if, if those are the starters, I, I'm amazed to hear what's next. That's, that's really impressive. So, so Nigel, Julie, I'm sure, curious, do you, did you have similar kind of pain points that you were starting with? Like, was there something that you felt like, hmm, this is the thing that's, that's the burr in my saddle that I need to address? Yeah, so back in 2008, most of you will recall, we had a financial crisis. So I guess being in banking, um, since then, we've experienced a lot of sort of regulatory changes. The volume of regulations increased, the complexity, and I guess the significance of failing to comply has increased as well, from a you know, personal criminal liability all the way through to sort of corporate impact and reputational impact. And so for that, that drove increasing pressure on the legal team, and that's really pushed us to try, I think, like Dorian says, to be a little bit more efficient and so we did, we tried really hard. We, we had a run at uh, Lean Six Sigma, and we had a bunch of lawyers trying to run that program and really drive some efficiencies. And we sort of ran into those problems, I think, 
you know, a lot of you and most of us will have run into, which is you have lawyers who are really interested in it, but also really busy trying to, to do it. Yeah. Um, and so that didn't work as well as we would have liked. And so about four years ago, when Clock was starting, we sort of heard about this fad, legal operations. We thought we'd have a crack at it. Um, <laughs> and we, we hired two people. So, you know, we're a team of a couple of hundred, and we thought two people is just the right number of people to fix this. <laughs> We thought we were overshooting by about 50%. But <laughs> <laughs> so we got our two people in. Um, and look, that started to make a difference, right? We had, instead of lawyers dabbling, we had professionals acting in their sweet spot. And that made a difference for us. I think we're up to about 10 people now. I think we realized we were under a little bit. Um, and you know, we're still playing with that number and trying to work it out. But it's made a big difference. <coughs> um, you know, we looked really hard at the work we do, and we identified, you know, three main categories of things, the sort of the flow work, um, the work that we send externally, and then the work, obviously, the team do internally. And we've tried to apply all the things that we've learned at Clock over the years to those different segments. So, in respect of the flow work, we've tried to process map that to within an inch of its life. Um, we've tried to automate parts of it where we can, We've tried to outsource parts of it where we can. And we've really tried to take that part of, of the work off our teams. And we've, we've focused on our externals as well. And we've done all the things that we've got vendors for here today. You know, we've looked at our e-billing. We've looked at our tendering processes. We've looked at our invoicing review. And we've really tried to drive some efficiencies in that space too. And that's really then given the team back um, for that bespoke work that they do. It's given them back the opportunity to really think deeply about some of the challenges we face. And so the phase that we're on there is, is really trying to look at our risk management frameworks and how we can put those in play, just to really help our team give good legal advice. Because at the end of all of this, that's what we're trying to do. And legal operations for us is the way that we do that as efficiently as we can. So I'll stop there. But. So Julian, I'm curious, were there any challenges that kind of drew you into the operations space? I mean. Dorian and Nigel have named all the things that I think push you into realizing, having that moment of realization that you need a legal operations team. I feel like you, you were doing legal operations before you have legal operations, right? I mean, you can't run a legal department. You have to budget, right. forecast, two of my favorite things. You have to do rate negotiations with law firms, one of my also favorite things. Um, you know, down to, you know, when you have a team that starts to be in the hundreds, planning a meeting is actually a big thing. You need to work on process. I think that's one of the biggest things. And you have lawyers trying to do their work at the same time they're trying to change the process behind that work. So all kinds of things led us to sort of little by little have people in the department doing these things and doing them I would say disparately, inconsistently, and in many cases quite poorly. And so we sort of came to a, a tipping point, sounds about the right same time, four years ago when clock was a thing, it became a trend, we had to get on it, but we came to a realization that we needed to bring all these things together and start thinking about this stuff more strategically for the very point Nigel makes, to let the lawyers think more strategically about the legal part of the work. And it's been an amazing journey, and I feel like we're, we're pretty young on our journey, but every year um, our legal operations team takes on more and new things, and everything they take on is, is made more efficient and better and makes my life so much easier. I mean, I joke all the time that one of my favorite things um, that my legal operations team does for me is assign offices when new people come into the company. <laughs> Because this used to literally keep me up at night, you know? Like, I'm making fair, and where is this person moving, and oh, this person got here two days before that person. And um, it's everything to, we have a global legal summit every two years where our team from all over the globe comes to San Francisco. The planning and execution of that is, as you can imagine, huge. And the, these events have gone from being okay and nice to phenomenal, engaging, um, team events because of our legal operations team. So it really spans from the budgeting to the process to just even the day-to-day -day running of a legal department, and it's certainly made my life a lot easier. I'm curious if there's anything that you're working on right now that goes <laughs> beyond perhaps the, the normal things that maybe your operations team might be helping you with. 
Yeah, so I'm um, not sure if anyone's heard, but we are separating Gap Inc. into two separate publicly traded companies over the next year, spinning off Old Navy into its own company. And I will admit that when we first started working on this earlier this year, it was mostly about going to the board and, and, and teeing it up. But sort of the minute we hit the ground running on how are we going to actually do this, and realizing the gigantic role that legal was going to play, if you can imagine. So not only do we need to create two new legal departments, which is super exciting and cool, but big, but we are also, as you can imagine, the key advisor to almost everyone else working on this transaction, this operational separation. And so um, Mike, who's my head of legal operations, has graciously agreed slash been voluntold uh, that he will uh, spend the next year as the um, key legal point for um, helping legal maneuver through the company separation. So this is a unique opportunity um, for our department and for our legal operations team to really step up and um, coordinate, project manage, help me build two new departments. I mean, I can't think of a thing they're going to end up having to work on, and I feel comforted to know that I have that competency inside my department to help me with this because it's a daunting task. I just say it's, a it's an important point to, 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 to make to all of you is that for many of us, our legal operations teams are getting that recognition in the broader corporation, not just within the legal team. The legal teams love them because they help them so much. But it's when your executive management and the teams over there in finance and over there in procurement and the team that's in you know, corporate development running M&A deals, when they recognize how valuable and important it is, that is really, really gratifying. Well, I would say one, of, yourselves one of our team's biggest wins, and I'm looking at Mikey sitting over there, was some of the process work we've done inside legal. Word got out, and the tax department came and said, can you help us do that in the tax department? <laughs> yeah. um, so things like that are starting to happen, too, where actually the reputation of the legal ops team is, is going beyond the legal department. It's great. I have to say. I'm not quite as enthusiastic about that broad recognition. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we hired, after a lot of challenges, some really good data scientists to help us analyze oh. the information we had. Yeah, <laughs> gone. <laughs> I think we had one guy, multiple PhDs, not sure how we got hold of him in the first place. And that's exactly right. He'd been with us about six months, and already oh, our head of right, data yeah. analytics was knocking on our door going, sure wouldn't mind talking to him, so he's disappeared off into the bank. <laughs> but um, it's, it's a, a good compliment. sign. It's, it's a, a compliment. compliment. Yes. <laughs> but as general counsels, I mean, so you're now exporting value, potentially, in a new and different way. And I mean, do you, so do you feel like you have a different tool set to, to kind of show and demonstrate the value of your organization? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you one, one great example at, at Oracle. We've been sort of nurturing this knowledge management uh, project for, for quite a long time, and it really started in the commercial group. Uh, where the commercial lawyers really need to be able to share a lot of their information. We have uh, playbooks, we have internal training, we have a, a bunch of different tools and devices. Uh, and, and we need to be able to get it across all of the commercial teams around the globe because we've got some places where we've got you know, one attorney, basically, in a, you know, out there in, in, a, in a country. So they all need to be on the same platform, they all need to have access to the same information. And so we have really curated this. We've, we had um, the lawyers from the commercial team actually asking to come into legal operations. So to Mary's point, it, you know, it's, it was sort of not trying to necessarily having to pull them in. We had people saying, can I come into to legal operations? So they would, they've come in and really built out this platform, both from a programmatic perspective, but also a technical perspective, because we've got technical people on the team now. And now we have people from the different management teams and we call you know, corporate operations sitting in the CEO's office that are coming and they, they want to see it. And, and they're saying, wow, the legal did this? The lawyers? Oh, you guys, this is pretty good. And uh, so we're able to use that to show what we've, not only what we've been doing, but give them a platform to be able to build on. And you know, hopefully one day uh, really uh, uh, make it, um, I'd love to make it a, a commercial product at some point. It'd be awesome. That would be fabulous. And I think there's a whole. There's <laughs> Although a whole I might, I might, I might lose the guy who's actually leading that project uh, to, uh, you know, I don't know, be head, head of product development or something like that. Well, N Nigel has remarked on the the yes. danger of bringing in great talent is right. then it, uh, you know, sometimes it finds its way elsewhere. So I'm curious, Nigel, if you have thoughts on what value looks like for you, like 
as a general counsel, what are the things that your team, your operations team brings to you that like, wow, I didn't necessarily have as much of that before. And it feels like I can do more things, that I can do my job maybe a little bit better, that I can have more influence. I'm curious if you have any examples. Yeah, so I think if you look, fundamentally we're trying to give good legal advice, right? I think if you sort of par back all the things that we're trying to do in the team. And so legal operations helps us deliver on that, um, whether that's through sort of efficiencies and tools and technology, um, or risk frameworks. And it's an interesting area we've been sort of looking at with our legal ops team. So I think historically, if you looked at the legal department and you asked the question, how do you manage your legal risk? The answer would be something like, we hire smart people, which is not really a system or a process. <laughs> I understand. But, and so we've been looking at that, and um, that's an area where our legal ops team have really helped us build out, you know, just probably quite simple things like you know, escalation frameworks, sign-off frameworks, a lot of the basic building blocks. And in doing that, they've sort of uncovered you know, areas where we have some challenges. So you know, we, I think we did due diligence on something like 18 different AI, and I use the term loosely, but I'm sure you'll all agree on that, um, systems. I think we've, we took five to a proof of concept and we rolled out three into delivery in the team. And I don't think we would have done any of that without our legal ops team. So that's the first piece. But I think, just to your point around value add, one of the really interesting things is that one of those systems we didn't roll out in the legal team, but we rolled it out in our marketing team. And the reason was that when we were looking at workflow and time spent and effort, a lot of effort was reviewing marketing material. Um, you know, we're a, a bank. So we're sort of constrained a little bit in what we can say. We can't say we will guarantee you X percent interest forever, for some <laughs> reason. Um, and so we got this AI solution that we had identified and we were looking to use in our team. And effectively, it rolls out real-time guidance to people writing ads. And we thought, we'll use this in the legal team for reviewing materials. And we got chatting to our marketing guys. And our head of marketing said, actually, we could use that on our side for when we're writing it. And so now we've rolled out that tool into the marketing team, funded by them, and they use it so that when they're drafting the materials, it you know, benefits from that sort of real-time guidance. You can't say the word guarantee without saying X, Y, and Z. You can't say this without saying that. And that's really a change, I guess, Darren, to your point, not necessarily in the legal team, but that the business benefit from directly. Um, and that's we're downstream from that, so by the time the material gets to us, we can see that it's been signed off through the app, and we're a bit more relaxed, and so our review is easier. And so I think for us, that's a really pragmatic example of how you know, legal ops had done a piece of work, identified an unusual use for it, and then we've managed to help our broader business with it. So I hope that gets there. So the, I, yes, and I think there's a couple things that I heard in there, and one is scale. Right, so as you have to do more, it, give, it basically gives you a fulcrum that creates leverage for you that lets you do excellence at scale. But the other thing I think I heard in there was velocity, in as much as it allows yeah. your business to move faster because better decisions are happening upstream. And the, the, I guess a third element of that is, is I wanna make explicit, is you're starting to put solutions in the business, yeah. right? It's not catching the cows after they've got out of the fence, right? You're actually helping to keep them in the fence. And if you look at a lot of the literature for the future of the practice of law, it's, it's exactly what you're talking about. It's actually spotting the patterns, figuring out where do they exist in the business, and then trying to instrument and pro provide solutions that operate at the point of decisions where the actual business people yeah. work. And so Julie, I, I see on your bio that you, you've got all kinds of cover, coverage on, on really risk and compliance. And I, you're clearly a forward thinking a thinker on this, and I'm, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how you bring together legal operations to make compliance maybe a, a more effective function? Yeah, I think actually legal, legal operations is going to be a, a huge support in the compliance space. And um, one of the places where um, our legal operations team has partnered really closely with our is with our privacy compliance team. So as we've had increasing regulations, Sam, so I'm gonna work it in, 
with GDPR. <laughs> I promised I was going to say that. <laughs> we were joking um, about like, that like earlier. We've got like a, have a drinking game for GDPR. <laughs> well done, Julie. <laughs> well done. <laughs> and, uh, and the new lovely, uh, we have a new law in California, the CCPA, um, coming into effect in January. So with the, the increasing privacy regulation and similar to what Nigel's talking about with our, our uh, marketing teams, product teams, tech teams, sort of wanting to get in the game and how they're using data and how they're in, interacting with our customers. Um, we've had some great success building some tools that are, they're not in the business, I haven't gotten quite that far, so I gotta look at that, but they're an interface between um, our um, product teams and our privacy team, which sits in our compliance world, um, to allow them to interact from the stage of building, so privacy by design, and have um, interactive conversations and uh, knowledge management built in so that each time you do it, you're not starting over from scratch with the business again. And so that's been a really great place where I feel like legal operations has, has really helped with compliance and I think there's a lot of future. I think AI is gonna offer a lot of interesting ways to look at ethical compliance, for example, and corruption and that kind of thing. So, and having a legal operations team, as Nigel puts us, enables us to actually try some of this stuff Honestly, it would be very hard to go out and look at, you know, the candy store of options and figure out what to bring in, how to test it, who's going to do that, who's going to take the day off from their lawyering job. So having a team that is dedicated to that will enable us to try some of these things and pilot them and ultimately land on some great solutions, I'm confident. So I think that blends very nicely back into where Dorian was going. So I, I am very intrigued by the fact that you guys are actually developing your own solutions. And I'm curious if at a high level you can maybe give us a little bit more about how you work with your ops team to, to try to make that go. Sure. Well, uh, some of it just came out of frustration, to be honest, because obviously we're a technology company, so uh, we make a lot of technology. But in order for us to try to um, get in the queue for our, our, our product suite, it's very, very difficult to, to do that. There's a long list of things, of enhancements, new modules, all, all kinds of ideas. Most focused on, I would say, on the finance side when it comes out of our own, our own business. So uh, after you know, kind of bumping up against that for, for a while, we just decided we would build it ourselves. <laughs> and we would bring in some people who could help us create these tools uh, in my hope that eventually we could, you know, then then move it over to the to the Oracle platform, but we really had this incredible need, a really really incredible need, not just for the commercial lawyers, uh, which is you know the the biggest group of lawyers that we have within the in the company, about 500 lawyers, but um, across the other practice areas because you know we've got litigation across the the globe, we've got employment issues across the globe. So to be able to have all this information and access to tools on a, on a common platform and then use that br more broadly as a communication tool. So when we bring in our new hires, we have uh, a space on what we call Legal Connect that introduces them to our you know, 500 other uh, people that they may not get to meet personally for, for a while. Um, we do that with our legal interns and our legal externs. If people are doing really interesting pro bono projects, we basically publicize that. Um, if people have been given uh, awards or particular accolades, we do that. We have a GC corner on this. We're, we're really trying to broaden this to be a, 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 a very, very big platform for communication within the legal department. And it's been very, very effective and, and very well received. People, it's just an easy place to go to get information. To be honest, if you go onto the Oracle internal website, um, there's so much information there, it's somewhat hard to navigate. So we had folks who were just very, very focused on the issues that we're dealing with as a legal department to be able to do things much, much more simply, much, much more intuitively, uh, we think. Uh, so it's been an incredible uh, benefit. Probably of all, the and we've done a lot of different things within the legal operations team that I'm, I'm really proud of, but, but this may be the, the, the biggest thing, the most impactful thing uh, and, I'm, and it continues to grow, and we've brought yet another of the commercial attorneys into it. The one rule that we've had is we've brought the commercial attorneys into knowledge management is that they have to continue to practice co 
commercial law. They have to continue to service certain customers, handle certain number of negotiations, because I've always believed that it's just wrong to think that those who can't do te actually teach. I think it's the other way around. I think if you do really, really well, then you can teach, but you have to keep doing. And so that's part of the, you know, I think part of the benefit is that these folks remain in active practice, much, much smaller, so it doesn't take up a huge piece of their time, but they've got their, they've got their hands in the game. So that's really interesting because what, a lot of what you're getting at, I think, is making sure that they retain a certain amount of knowledge, but also empathy for sure. what the customer experience is and what people are trying to solve. And I'm curious if in the work that uh, Nigel or Julie have done, do you have any similar kind of traps for the unwary as you're thinking about, oh, I'm, I'm going to build tools or I'm going to build solutions. Uh, by the way, there's a bear trap over there, so maybe don't <laughs> step on that one. So I would say we're not a technology company. Uh, we sell clothes, but uh, <laughs> increasingly every company is a technology company, right? Data is, is the currency, and I think one of our challenges is, um, I'm surprised to hear that it's as hard as it is at Oracle, given that you are a technology company, but is technological solutions always seem to be the ones that jump to the forefront and are the most obvious, and they come with bells and whistles, and they usually come with someone who's promoting them, and they're going to solve you know, world hunger and peace overnight. But the reality is not, that's not always possible in our environment in terms of getting in the queue, which it's a very long queue at the gap sometimes, to have technology and have it connect into our legacy systems in a way that allows it to work. And so I would say one of the bear traps that we talk a lot about with our legal operations team is to not always default to technology that a lot of what you can do is build process and make better ways of doing things, and ultimately that actually will make the technological solution smoother and better and clearer once you get to it. And so we've, we've worked really hard on just work on the process, just how does the thing flow from point A to point B, and then sure, at some point it would be lovely if we could automate it, make it automatic, have a machine do it for us, but we don't have to, we don't have to wait, and in fact, we would actually sort of we'll find ourselves in a bear trap if we put the technology in place before we built the process. So I think that's the biggest learning I've had is that we have to sometimes pause on the technology, build the process, and then get in line for the technology, which can be a long line sometimes, but at least you have a process. I totally agree with that, and I am with a technology company, but sometimes, you know, what happens with the process, it builds on itself, and then people get very, very invested in that process, and you look at it and you say, this makes no sense anymore. We need to break it, we need to blow it up, we need yeah. to simplify it. And sometimes it's very hard to get people to do that, but if you have a team that's dedicated to that, yeah. they can make it happen a lot more quickly, a lot more easily. And, and I think, just to pick up on that, that flexibility to change has been really, uh, that, that was my bear trap example for us. Yeah. So we focused really hard on self-service. So our thinking was, there's lots of stuff that lawyers do that actually is filling in templates and fairly standardized. And we can teach our business how to do it themselves. And so that will really um, alleviate some of the burden on the team. So we did the lawyer thing. We set up a website and we dumped several thousand documents on it. <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> it was all well drafted. It made sense. It had all the law in there. Strangely, it had a lot of hits for about the first month, mostly lawyers, and then tapered off. So. We did that first, and then we had our legal ops team have a look at it, and they said, well, look, there's these things called chatbots you may have heard of, and if you put that in there, then people won't have to look through all the stuff, that's a technical term, that you've dropped on this website. They'll be able to ask the chatbot the question. So we spent another year getting the chatbot up, convincing our IT team to let us host it and put it behind the security wall and all of that. And so we had the chatbot up, and it was working. We were you know, as lawyers, pretty proud of the, the technology. We're not, we're not great as a bank at technology sometimes. And so we had this chatbot up and running, and we thought, this is the solution. And about six months after we'd rolled out our solution, the bank as a whole went live with IBM Watson as their chatbot. <laughs> Ours was really good. <laughs> But here we had a um, piece of technology supported by the whole of our group tech. Uh, 
Um, and so we very quickly decided it would be better if we put our questions into their tool rather than persisting with our chatbot. And so I think for me that, that was a learning um, and one that we've now tried to reapply to other parts. And that is where you can, so to your point, legal is a small part of most of our organizations. And if you can leverage the software stack that they already have and the tools they already have, a lot of ours are designed by Oracle, that's a lot easier than trying to go in as a legal team and build your own thing. Um, so that would just be my, my thought. Leveraging existing IT stacks is a lot easier than trying to start from scratch. That makes a lot of sense. So now I'm going to go to a very selfish question. So you guys have since said some very, uh, I would say, unlawyerly uh, like things, like blow it up, process <laughs> mapping. And I'm curious, how do you get your legal professionals to engage different ways of working, specifically thinking about actually redesigning the processes that underpin their work, or maybe even leaving things behind and not doing what they've done in the past. Like, how do you help them move along? Well, I think a lot of it just comes down to, to, to leadership. So what I said at the very, very beginning was that I wanted to have ownership, meaning as we're trying to implement that, think about what that change ought to be, design it, implement it, to have somebody have real ownership from start to finish. And it can't be the head of litigation. It can't be the head of M&A. It can't be the head of privacy and security. They just, they've got so much to do. They have to be involved, but if you have somebody with that ownership and that leadership taking it from the start to the end, it was very easy. I mean, it was actually remarkably easy to get people to, to buy into it. We needed less of their time. Uh, we needed to, to to get their expertise, so gain insights from their particular expertise on the specific legal issues and the specific problems they were dealing in their functional area. But if they didn't have to own it, they were just as happy as clams and things moved very, very quickly. I would say it's a little bit harder outside of the legal group um, because we've, we've had to, we've, you know, as an organization, we've had to morph and change a, a lot over the years. So it's a bit in our, in our DNA, but the, the difficulty, the challenge, was having somebody own it and take it all the way through. Um, and then people just you know, got completely on board. So there really wasn't an issue with it. That's really helpful. So Julie, if I'm an operations professional who doesn't have a GC who's quite as woke as you are on this, <laughs> like how might I go about convincing you and, and bringing you along to see the value of this? Um, I would say prove it out. So it's one of the things that we talked about when we started our legal operations function is let's identify two or three low-hanging fruits, is that fruit? <laughs> um, and projects that we can go out and engage the department in and show success and then celebrate that success. And I will personally celebrate it and call it out so that people see this is the way we're going to do things going forward. But let's make sure they're going to be successful. Let's start with some easy stuff. So that's kind of what we did across the first year. And then, you know, there are people throughout the department, many of whom are actually even lawyers, who are, are pretty woke, who actually like to break things and um, are good at it and know how to do it. And so leveraging those people and having them collaborate with the legal operations team on the brainstorming part of it. But then to Dorian's point, having the legal operations team whose job it is to break it, put it back together, and get it up and running, see if it works, if not, go back, break it down again, and having them dedicated to that versus distracted, moon timing, doing it on the weekend, is really the only way I think you, you get the bigger, not low-hanging fruit stuff done. And I think as a leader, what you have to do is you have to celebrate the success, um, allow failure, and, and even laud failure sometimes, let people try things. And then I just, I found myself two weeks ago saying to a group that I wanted to reorganize the structure of how they were put together. And I just said, if you come back to me with anything that looks like this, I will consider it failure. So just understand that I want you to blow it up and try it blown up. And if it doesn't work, we can go back. There's no, there's no harm or foul. So I think it's a combination of leadership, allowing failure, and then to Dorian's point, having that team who can just drive through and keep it moving and create the loop with the failure of the success going forward. 
And Nigel, if I'm at a larger organization that is just kind of systemically more conservative, the, the clients that I serve, you know, are highly regulated, uh, you know, change is sometimes painful. H how do I help bring them along if I want to move a little bit faster to serve them more effectively? That's a good question. I think we've had a lot of change perhaps over the last five years. It's been sort of unprecedented, I think. You know, we've gone fully agile, so we've sort of done away with offices, we've gone paperless, we've done away with technology. And in a funny way, so we've done away with paper and we've now moved to technology. Yeah, don't um, do away with technology. <laughs> I know, you just suddenly panicked. <laughs> um, but that's really created a, an environment where there has been a lot of change and so people are, are a little bit more open to it. I think one of the first things we did as a function um, on that journey was we held a couple of hackathons. So that was, I think to Julie's point around low hanging fruit, we got the team together with some vendors and some of our external firms. And we, you know, we took them out of the building, we did the full, we tried to do the full technology company thing. You know, 24 hours all together in a room, three or four ideas all the way through to delivery. And it really got a sort of a bit of a culture change going. People started to think, actually, we can do this stuff. And we delivered a couple of ideas. We turned them into apps and we put them out there. And the reality is, I think the one we thought was the best idea didn't work. But we got it live and people saw it and people used it for a little while. And that really drove the mindset. You know, we had people sitting agile, we had people using the technology much more than they had previously. And we're now demonstrated to them that if you have a problem, we're prepared to listen to you. And not just listen to you, but we can actually deliver something into reality. And once they understood how that process worked, I think people were much more open to trying it again. And so since then, the problems that we've been comfortable tackling have grown in size. Um, but I think those culture changes right at the outset, um, that sort of a hackathon type concept of think about it, do it quickly, and then just put something out there and see if it works, drove a little bit of a change for us. And, and I think that's grown and we've built on that with the, the legal ops team. Fabulous. So Julie, both you and Nigel were I think implicitly talking about really investment on some level. And I'm curious, how you think about when you have something that is emergent, that is a new problem, whether you think about going after it, let's just say conventionally, like, well, I'm gonna go get some attorney headcount, or if you think about doing it a slightly different way. I mean, you describe like, hey, I want you to blow up the shape of this, come back with something new. How do you think about giving your people a new way of looking at solving a problem, perhaps with different investment models in the resources and the people? Yeah, so I mean, it's a journey and I, I won't pretend that I have all the answers, but I think when I'm looking at parts of the legal department where people are just too busy, and that happens all the time, and actually one of my favorite things about legal ops is I have metrics now that can prove that they're busy. I don't have to just go on feeling like they're doing three times as many agreements as they were doing a year ago, um, or we have 20 more regulations than we had last month, but looking at the work going on in that group and trying to step back and say, do we need, to your point, to add another attorney? Is that going to solve the problem? Or do I need to have the legal ops team go in there and sort of help think about process and potentially take something either off the plate of that team? Are they doing something that legal ops could be doing? Or is the process not as efficient as it could be? And so more and more starting with that, and, and seeing what that yields, because maybe that yields you, you know, half a headcount of time, and suddenly you don't need to hire another attorney. Now, eventually, when you keep doing that, you will need to hire more legal operations people. <laughs> but I think it's a flex back and forth at any given moment to say, is there is there something the legal ops team can do to alleviate the burden on on the lawyers, or do I actually am at the point where I actually need another lawyer? And you know, it's it's a it's a cycle. So as you hire one of more legal ops, then you need more lawyers. And, but I think each time stopping and asking that question is really beneficial because a lot of times you can gain a lawyer headcount or part of one simply by pulling some things out or improving process rather than the, what used to be the natural inclination of, I just need another lawyer. So that is a very thoughtful approach to bringing different perspectives to solving problems. And I think the research tells us that 
having people with different backgrounds, different perspectives, tends to give you more creative solutions. And Dorian, I'm curious if diversity is something that you guys are going after and that you're using your operations function to help you take forward. Sure. It's been um, a priority for us, for us um, I'd say the entire 27 years that I've been at Oracle. Our general counsel at that time was Rhea Campo, who was very active uh, in the movement for greater diversity in the legal profession uh, writ large. Um, so it's been something that's really important to us for, for a long time, and we're pretty proud of the diversity in our team, uh, both uh, overall and in the management positions. But there's always more that we can do. And sort of at that high level, you know, we just want the, we want the team to reflect the communities in which we live and work because, um, you know, the research is pretty clear um, that we'll just do better as a, as a business. Um, but it's also just the, the right thing to do. Those perspectives are incredibly helpful. So what we've been doing is, um, is gathering much more data, uh, both internally about our own teams, which is a little bit tricky um, because of privacy laws and uh, consents uh, and everything, but it's, we're, we're trying to get a, a, a better sense of, kind of where we are in the particular jurisdictions. And it's not fair to count our entire Latin American team as you know, our overall Hispanic count. That's just not really fair. I know some companies do that, but... Um, so we're trying to do this um, you know, within, the, within the regions and in some cases even within the, the jurisdictions. And we, and we talk about this all the time. So our legal operations team has been gathering a lot of data internally as much as they can, and then we present it back uh, to the organization. And I talk about it a lot at our legal management uh, committee meetings. And then we're gathering a lot of data externally because, as, as we know, we have a lot of influence with our outside providers. I know Julie's been very, very involved in this. Nigel, you probably have been too, but, but Julie uh, has been very involved for quite some time. And we're trying to make sure that we're maintaining that dialogue with them and we're requiring them to provide us with information, very detailed information so they can tell that we're, we don't want just this high level thing. We actually want the, we want the details and we demand certain amount of, of diversity on our, on our teams, you know, in the lead positions. So that has been a really interesting dialogue, but it has led us to be invited in more into the law firms mm -hmm. to be talking about what we're doing internally. So we can share so much more information, and really our legal ops team has, has led that. It's been incredibly useful for us. So it's still, a, it's still a journey. It will always be a journey, and we're doing it by this sort of this information sharing with external partners, information sharing internally, and then trying to use some tools so that as we are bringing people into our organization, we start with a better pipeline. We're required to go through our internal recruiting organization, which hasn't always used the, the, all of the, the newest and the greatest tools, but there's this terrific tool called Textio where you can actually improve your, your purchase requisition, the way you frame it, the way you write it, to actually attract more diverse candidates. And, um, and it's great for lawyers because you get, you get very competitive. You get a score. And you know, I'm sorry, I got a 63? Well, how did I get a 63? I'm much better, <laughs> I can do better. And then you can like, change. you have to change it yourself, but you learn, you're on a learning curve about the right kind of language uh, to use so you can get yourself up there to you know, 98 or 99. Um, I think 100 might be impossible. But uh, you know, that has been a useful thing too, just in terms of the pipeline of the folks that we've got coming in for, for interviews. So they've been experimenting with lots of uh, different things. We have an internal uh, committee just within the, within the legal department to drive discussions going down to a, to a pretty deep level uh, where people will be maybe more comfortable talking with the colleagues that they're working with very, very closely as opposed to talking to somebody in upper management. That's been useful. Um, but we have, but that committee is made up of the of the actual Oracle legal um, uh, attorneys and and some assistants, as opposed to legal operations professionals. They they sort of lead the discussion, um, and that has been a very useful thing for us as well. So uh, overall, it's been it's been a tremendous amount of work for them, and I think probably some of the most gratifying work. So there are two elements in there that I, I found really interesting. One is you really are focused, and this is on the outside counsel side, 
focused on leadership, mm -hmm. not just necessarily who's doing the work, but who's leading the work. I think that's probably a very powerful question to ask your partners. Sure. And the other thing I found is, you're, you're, I think I heard, it makes the relationships better. Definitely does. And, and so it's Definitely. not one of the situations where it's, it's a, a, a zero sum that where it actually, or it gets worse, it actually gets better. Right. And you called out your colleague, Julie, on, as doing some interesting things. I'm curious if you have any thoughts. So, you know, I think Dorian said it, there's just too much information out there to prove that diversity makes you better um, in every way. And so in our department specifically, we sort of look at it in three channels. Uh, we have a team dedicated to the pipeline, by which I mean creating more diversity in, you know, kids who are interested in going, going to get to college and want to become lawyers. Um, we have a team focused on ourselves and our own diversity and recruiting practices and all of the things Dorian alluded to. And then we have a team focused on our external partners. And our legal operations team has played a, a really great role in that work. Uh, one of the things we used to spend a lot of time on was surveying our outside counsel to get all this data. And it, it seems like you could just kind of use the same survey over and over, but we kept upping the ante. Um, two things about you know, who, who gets to vote on partnership, who makes comp decisions, how are leaders picked, um, the increasingly nuanced questions. So the legal ops team has had a, a really important role in streamlining that and, and automating and making that survey uh, easier and having the data come back to be more useful. Uh, but I was actually uh, very heartened in Mary's opening remarks to hear about clock kind of turning a little bit towards the law firms because I think that there's, there's something blocking all of us. Um, we've all been pounding away at diversity for a long time. It's been a priority. I've been a gap 21 years. It's been a priority the whole time. I feel like our law firms are very engaged with us. It has improved our relationship. They are trying. They are putting diverse people on our accounts. But the needle's not moving. Um, it's really not changing if you look out um, across you know, who's becoming a partner, who's becoming the law firm lead. And so I think that there's a, an intersection between diversity and innovation and this collaboration that there's something there where we need to help each other. And if we really want to see an unlock in our profession, we, we need more. We need people thinking about it differently and um, on both sides, both the client and the law firms. And so I actually think this is a, a really interesting place where clock can play. And I'm excited to, to see what that turns out to be because it's just, it's not, again, we're all trying and we all have good intentions, but things are just really not changing. And I'm personally a little frustrated, so I'm hoping maybe bringing a new, <coughs> a, a new set of eyes and a new set of skills to it might, might bear fruit. So Nigel, I'm curious what this looks like for you in Australia. So I think many of us have a very US focused view on what yeah. diversity means. And I'm, I'm curious what the <coughs> context of that is for you. I, I think all the challenges are the same. We're, we're sort of not unique in that respect. I, I sort of, I joined Westpac maybe five years ago. Um, and they had, you know, when they hired me, they sort of gave me a lot of marketing material about how diverse they are and their recruitment practices and, and all of this. And I thought that's really interesting, you know, that's great. And I, I sort of, you know, being a lawyer, I was a little bit, eh, you know, cynical perhaps about it. And so I joined and I think I have a really, and I always tell the story, but it sort of embarrasses my boss, but not a great thing, but I don't think she's here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Is this live? <laughs> in that first month that I was in the bank, we had a, a relationship meeting with one of the big Australian law firms, you know, top two or three, and they were introducing their new relationship partners to us. Um, it was her and I, and we were, we were meeting them, so we walked into the room together, and she looked around, and the, the new relationship partners were four men. And she didn't go and sit at the table, she just said, look, guys, I'm not sure this is going to work. You need to read our guidelines around diversity. Perhaps we can catch up next week. And we walked back out again, not <laughs> having sat down. But yeah, <laughs> how good is that? <laughs> and, and for me, that was a real moment of, you know, here is someone who genuinely, it's not just words on paper, and she genuinely believes this. And it was absolutely the right thing to do. And they came back with another panel of two men, two women, and they're still our relationship partners. But to your point, it takes that sort of action to drive 
some change. This is not just paperwork. This is not just a policy that we have. This is something we believe in. And for me, that was really powerful. And yeah, I think it shows that there is that genuine belief and drive there. So I want to reinforce that because I think it's often the case, and this I think builds on what Dorian was saying, we often the, it's often the case that we feel awkward asking the people who serve us to do certain things, right? That we actually want. And if they did those things, we would probably work together more effectively because, oh, I don't want to offend or so forth and so on. And I love to hear that we are empowered to do that. That to serve our business, we can go to our partners and say, this is how we could work together more effectively. And I feel like, you know, you're basically giving us all permission to go do that. It's, you know, I don't feel, do you feel awkward? I don't feel awkward no. doing that at all. And the more you do it, the more you do it, the less awkward you feel. Absolutely. <laughs> so Plus, we're paying them a lot of money, right? And, and you've got to ha have that comfortable relationship where you can just be really, really frank with one another. We invite frankness from our firms as well. We say, hey, that's that's a two-way better, street. you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, never feel awkward about it. Well, you, so you guys are clearly modeling that. And that's what causes it to be transmitted through your organizations. Because when you do that and you do it visibly, like the rest of us will be like, oh, I guess I can do that too. So we are almost out of time. You have a large assembled audience of people who would, would love to hear some closing thoughts. So if you just have a few things you might offer us on the way out to empower us to serve our, our community better, we, we would love to hear from you. Uh, sure. Well, what I would say is, uh, you know, aside from the role being in incredibly uh, important, it's one of those roles that I think we should be careful about over-defining it. Because one of the joys that I've found in working with legal operations is the fluidity with which it, it changes and picks certain things up and then moves things over here and then picks new things up. Yes, a lot of it is, is business process, the program management office for the, for the law department, but it really has moved in a lot of different directions and I think we, it's important for us to let it move in those different directions and to experiment, not be afraid to fail. We accept that there's going to be some, some failure. We're just gonna go right back at it and, and, and fix it and, and roll on. Uh, and let it be what you most need it to be right now and then as you're looking out into the future because in three years, it's going to be something different. And that's, and that's okay, that's actually for me, that's the beauty of the organization. Nigel? One of the things that we talk about a lot, which I think is, is very similar, is this concept of a curious mind. Um, and it's about bringing curiosity. We, we talk to our lawyers and we try and train our lawyers that you know, when you're trying to understand a problem, you know, be curious, There's a childlike curiosity. You're not confrontational, not aggressive, not inquisitive, not inquisitional, but just curious. And I think we apply that to our legal advice, you know, understand why the business is seeking it, understand what the problem is, understand what the facts are. And I think if you can take that childlike curiosity and apply it to legal operations and to processes, it's the same thing. You know, why are we doing it this way? How can we do it better? Is there a tool that can help us? Is there a different way we can think about the system and process? So, so for me, it's that bring that curious mind to what you do. And I think our legal operations team and having that diversity of, of talent um, has brought a different perspective. And as long as we keep that curiosity alive, I think we're heading in the right direction. So. I'd echo everything um, that Dorian and Nigel said. And in fact, I would have said almost the exact same thing, but they've said it. <laughs> so uh, just to sort of to riff on that a little bit, I think that there is a, a beauty in the information sharing and um, coming into a legal operations function in a company with ideas and practices and processes and things that might work, but it's the might work that's key for me. It's keeping that open mind, that curiosity, thinking about the company in which you sit, the personality, the culture, uh, the strategic objectives, and how do, you, how do you fit what you bring as a legal operations professional into that culture and that organization? There's no plug and play. And in fact, I think legal operations at its, at its best when it is sort of innovating and keeping a curious mind and thinking, what can we bring to this problem? Not I have the solution, but let me learn and think about what the solution might be and sort of pull pieces from different things um, that you've learned from your colleagues or learn from conferences like this, learn from each other. Uh, but I think it's going to have to evolve and change over time, and the role will evolve and change over time. And that's where I think it's, it's, it's most powerful, is, 
you know, you'll never be done, there'll never be a playbook um, of, of how to do it. Um, every year you have to sort of reinvent yourself and think about, you know, what are the key things that my company, my legal department is facing this year and how can I be of the most help um, on that journey. So absolutely that is the key, I think, is that evolution. So this personal tutorial session has been amazing for me, and so I am grateful. Your time is precious, and uh, your, your wisdom is fantastic. And so thank you so much. If we could thank our...